Hello. In this video on socio-economic change and urban transport, I will discuss only one topic, changes. Changes between dominant transport modes and changes within the current transport system. This still sounds a bit vague, but I will explain. The world's population is increasing and a larger share lives in cities. An important, more general socio-economic change is that in many cities, people are getting richer. Rich people travel more kilometers and more, more often they use fast modes, they fly more and have more cars and less fuel efficient cars. If the world's population is getting richer, we can expect an increase in motorized travel unless we implement policies. I next distinguish changes between uh, dominant travel modes and win within modes. I start with changes between dominant modes. With changes between dominant modes, I refer to new travel modes becoming dominant. History has shown that it on average takes about 55 years for a new mode to become the dominant mode. Note that the car, the dominant mode nowadays, was already introduced on the market over 100 years ago. The last new mode is the aircraft, which has been gaining popularity for over 60 years now. So, if people suggest that in a few decades the transport system will differ dramatically from the current system, because new modes become dominant, we have to be careful. I'm not sure this is realistic. Maybe information and communication technologies, ICT, might become a new mode, but this is quite speculative because so far the net effect of ICT on travel has been around zero, if not a small increase in travel. To check the realism of visions for the future, a general rule of thumb is that if you want to explore the future for a certain period, it is good to look back the same number of years to see how much change one can expect in a certain period. I now discuss changes within the current car-dominated transport system. I refer to changes between modes we already have available. In other words, changes in the shares of cars, public transport, walking and cycling. Such a change occurred in the centres of many western cities between 1967 and 1973. Cities started to realise that building more roads and more parking places was not the way to proceed. Instead, city centres needed to be attractive and livable places, not dominated by cars, even though this came at the cost of the ease of travelling by car to and in the city centre. City centres became more attractive for walking and in some cases also for the bike. And travelling by public transport to and within the city became important as well. In addition, such, such centres became safer and the mode shift resulted in less CO2 emissions, air pollution and noise. I think the main challenge is to reduce the use of our aircraft and cars and increase the use of public transport and the share of walking and cycling. But cars will remain important for decades, so another challenge is to shift to more fuel efficient cars and less CO2 emitting cars and maybe shared cars. Land use and transport planning can stimulate a shift away from individual car use, both for reasons of livability, as well as because of accessibility and climate change. Such policies are not necessarily expensive policies. For example, 
policies aiming to stimulate cycling are relatively cheap. Since some years, many cities worldwide encourage cycling. Examples being London, New York, Paris, Bogota and Santiago, Chile. The shift away from conventional cars to cleaner cars, public transport and walking and cycling will make cities much more attractive and will reduce CO2 emissions, air pollution and noise. A final remark, there is often more resistance from people before than after implementation. This means that it takes brave policy makers to implement controversial policies, but after implementation, people will often increasingly appreciate these policies.